Winds of change are banging us around like crazy all the time these days, and yet most of us have no idea of the extent of this buffeting and how it's affecting our lives as we go through this journey together. I'm Granville Tugut. I'm chairman of the Liminal Group, and I have with me today Dalton Conley. He's the author of a new book called Elsewhere USA, how we got from the company man, family dinners, and the affluent society to the home office, Blackberry moms, and economic anxiety. Well, that raises a lot of questions, and uh, I'm sure you have a lot of answers. Uh, I love this book. I thought it was a great book. I had fun reading it. I, I, I think you did a terrific job of uh, taking us out of uh, the academic sphere and bringing it in into the lap of the, of, of the common man, and I include myself there. So I had a great time reading this, and I learned a lot. Um, I found it so full of stuff, I hardly know where to begin. So I'm going to begin by asking you, what do you think are the biggest changes that we see around us, and how are they affecting our lives, and how are they going to continue to affect our lives? Well, there are three real major changes, I think, that have taken place in the last three or four decades. And one of them we all know, we all can see around us, it's kind of obvious, and that's the technological changes, the Wi-Fi, wireless revolution, uh, the development of the internet and how that's changed how we work and how we live our private lives uh, and blended those two worlds. But there's two other less visible changes that I think are equally important. In fact, together with the technological changes, form the perfect storm that we're experiencing right now. And those are the rising labor force participation of women and particularly mothers over the last 30 years, and secondly, rising economic inequality at the top, where, where all the, the rise in, in, in the inequality has been uh, since 1970. Well, let's look at the inequality of, 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 of income. Uh, can, can you tell us in, in, in very simply what that means to all of us? Well, most of us, when we think of inequality, economic inequality, we think of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. But uh, over recent history in the United States, that's not what ha has happened, actually. If you break out inequality, the sort of the spread of incomes uh, across the American population into two halves, you know, the, the middle class to the bottom and the middle class to the top, you find that o over the last three or four decades, the re re ratio to, from the middle to the poor has been stable. There has not been a rise in uh, inequality at the bottom half. The poor have not been getting poorer. But what's happened is that if you stand at the middle and look up, the, the, we see withering heights. It's been getting steeper and steeper and more spread out. Uh, and the, the, the really interesting thing is the further up the ladder you go, not only are the gaps bigger, but the rate of increase in differences is bigger. So it creates this paradoxical effect that the further up the ladder you move, the more you're doing better in absolute terms, but you feel more relatively deprived because uh, the, your, your people just above you are pulling away even more. I guess what everybody wants to know is um, you are painting a picture, and I think you do it better than anybody. You're painting a picture of how our world is changing in stunning ways, and you do it really, really well. This is a really fun book to read, but people want to ask you the question, and I don't know whether you can answer this, but um, all, for, all of our, for all of our good fortune and for all of our technology and for all of our wealth, is it doing us any good? Are we any happier? Are we getting more out of life? That's, I guess, the $64 question. Knows, yeah. the, the, I would say that if we learn to manage these things, they can enrich our lives. Do you have any thoughts of how to manage them? I do. I think that the companies in particular that don't try to enforce the old modernist boundaries that enforce FaceTime, enforce uh, you know, bans on personal use of the internet at work and so forth, uh, enforce a kind of uh, notion of when work begins and wor when work ends, and instead invest in their human resources, to their, their capital, their human capital, so to speak, to make work as unworklike as possible. And I point in the book to Google as the Google. consistently, of course, it's the, the quintessential. The yeah, absolute best example. Of, of, the, of what the new economy looks like, but also of a new HR strategy. They spend an enormous amount of money literally making the, their Googleplex, as they call their headquarters, right. into 
a pl giant playroom, a, r a romper room, where there's right. volleyball, where uh, all the food you want is free, right. that you're, you don't need to join a health club because they've right. got it. Uh, they even have massages right, right. and so forth. They think you can get your hair cut, your dry cleaning done. Right. And at first glance, it seems like, my God, in this, these days... Uh, the ultimate company town of the yeah, 19th century. It's, it's, yeah, it's a lot more pleasant right, than right. working in a coal mining company town, but essentially, uh, you know, it's still the same thing. It costs them a lot of money up front, but what do they get out of that? They, they get productivity. It, you know, would you rather you know, spend the money to give your programmer a free lunch, right. or, um, and then they work another couple hours yeah. so that uh, you get a lot uh, done, yeah. uh, or have them grumpy about wages and so forth? And it's actually in, not incidental that, that Google's wages are slightly below yeah. um, the uh, local market average. So I think the companies that learn to uh, blend the, their, the worlds of home and work and leisure and work uh, are gonna be the ones that are successful. And the ones that try to cling to an old model that enforce divisions and try to regulate what their, 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 their knowledge employees are doing at any particular time and, and invest in surveillance and that kind of stuff. And I just think we're seeing some changes. We, companies are beginning to, even, even old line companies are beginning to acknowledge that. They're not total knuckleheads after all. So they, they have some, some sense of, of, of what they ought to be doing. What would you say to the 24 year old kid who's just out of uh, college or he may be out of um, business school or he may be out of law school or whatever, or she may be out of law school. What would you tell this person in the job market that's totally in the tank at the moment while we do this interview? What would be the smart thing to do, knowing what we know now through your book? Give, can you think of three things that, that people can remember and go do? I can think of one at least, and that's that if they can afford it, you know, they did probably just were in school not working uh, and acquired some debt perhaps, and, uh, but also learned to live on the cheap for a while, at least while they were in school. If they can continue that lifestyle, they can offer their labor for free for a while uh, in a as tight labor intern. as an intern um, at their dream place if they can get it, uh, and, they're, and they're, the, it's a win-win situation for their putative employer where they get free labor uh, and an enthusiastic person, and they get the skills and they're enhancing their, uh, their resume, their human capital for the long run, for when things turn around. I like to think of myself as an individual, and I, like, I would like to posit that it's very real. There's a very real possibility that individualism can, if we choose to have it so, continue to exist in a very real sense in our personal lives. You can put the Blackberry down, you can take a walk, you can say no to the Twittering, and you can just ignore uh, the phone when it rings or whatever's going on. You don't have to do any of this stuff. And I, 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 I grieve if we've lost the American individual ideal because I think part of our future depends on being able to have some of that left, don't you? I don't know. I th I, 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 I commend you to be a, your ability to put down your Blackberry and uh, concentrate on the people around you. Don't be misled, I'm a Crackberry addict. Yeah. Yeah, so. You and I were, grew up in a, in a pre-digital era. We grew up in an ethic of individualism, yet we're confronted with this world of multiple data, constant data streams. The younger generation, digital natives as they're called, or Generation Y, who knows how it's gonna turn out for them because they're in the midst of this flow uh, they don't have that. You can't go backpack through South America or Europe and be out of touch anymore. Um, it's blogged and Twittered and, and your parents can get in touch with you all the time. It's a very different uh, brain development at that point. And I wonder how much of how they behave that's quite different than how I behave at least is related to their age and how much of it's cohort. Because once they get kids and they've got more responsibilities, are things gonna change for them? We'll see. This is great stuff. I've had a great time talking to you. I've been talking to Dalton Conley. He's the author of Elsewhere USA. It's a great book. It's well written. I had a lot of fun reading it, and I had even more fun talking to you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Anvil.